Holy Spirit, we thank you for what you're doing, what you've already done in this room, the way that you've even set captives free and caused our heart to fly as we, as we worshiped, as we went through those gates and removed stones and we cast up a highway and over our city it became a, a canopy, a canopy of, of glory, a canopy of praise and that really just began to release prosperity in our cities. Lord, we just pray today that as we share and teach and, 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 as, and as we, even as we pray this morning, that people's hearts would be set free from, um, uh, from the prison of, of maybe even their own demise and released into the freedom that you've planned for each of us. Lord, we just release that over each person in the name of Jesus. You know, before we start, can you just um, keep your head bowed for a moment? I was uh, really surprised in the Moral Revolution Conference. I felt so strongly one night that there was a spirit of suicide on several people, and I, I, just, I hesitated, but I felt like we were supposed to do that. And I, I just felt again in the worship this morning that there was people that you just been pounded, hounded by a spirit of suicide. And you know, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And I went through a season a couple of, I guess it's been almost three years ago, where I had that, that whole suicidal thing for about two weeks. I didn't have any desire to kill myself, but it certainly plagued my mind. And I'd like everyone just to bow your head for a moment, and please take the cameras off the crowd. And if, you, uh, if that's you, would you just raise your hand? I'm not going to have you come forward or anything. I'm just going to pray for you right where you're at. Leave your head down, but raise your hand if you've just been plagued with that thing. There was, like, there was like 30 or 40 people in our conference. Yeah, just leave your hand up for just a minute, please. I'm not going to embarrass you. Yeah, there's probably 15 people in here and people who are watching from iBethel TV. We just release freedom right now. Let's just pray together on this issue. We just release freedom right now. We break the spirit of death and suicide and depression and discouragement and hopelessness. And we say to each one of you that had your hands up that you will, that you will laugh again, that you will live again, that you will dream again, that you will have visions again, that the desire for life is coming back into you even as we're praying for you right now. And that that thing's a spirit, it's against you, it's not, it's not something that's in you or or it's not something you want to do, but it's the enemy's way of trying to, to take out a, a prince, a princess of God. And even Jesus himself, when he was tempted in the wilderness, he was, one of the temptations was to throw yourself off the pinnacle of this temple. And so that suicide solution is something the devil has, has not changed in more than 2,000 years. And Lord, we just release peace and life, and these people would exit this wilderness into the power of the Spirit. And everybody together said... Amen. That's good. And this morning I want to talk to you about the process of, the, uh, of promises. And you know, we are, uh, in this house, we are very, very uh, intentional about prophetic declarations being positive and setting a course for our destiny and, our, and, and, uh, our, uh, and molding us into the people that we're called to be. And I think that there are just times that we need to remember that in the midst of this process, like when the Lord gives us a prophetic declaration, in between the, the, the promise and the palace, so to speak, there is a process. And about every couple of years, I feel like I, just, I need to just take this message back out of the archives and, and revisit it. Because one of the, I think the positive thing about, uh, about our movement is that everybody in this place that's been here for any length of time has this deep sense of significance. Like, I was born to be amazing. I'm called as a royal priesthood. I was born to change the world. I was born to disciple nations. And I think the negative side, or if I could say the, 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 um, the weak side of that message is that sometimes we forget that God takes a long time to act suddenly. And that between, between the time that God gives us a promise and the time that we actually see the fulfillment of that promise, there's oftentimes a process, and that process is actually what we need to, to come into the promise. It's what we need to actually stay in the promise. And um, I, I love what uh, the book of Exodus, let's see if I can find it quickly. In the book of Exodus, God said this, that's the 23rd chapter. He said, I will not drive out your enemies in a single year, that the land may not become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. 
but I will drive them out little by little until you become fruitful and take possession of the land. I will not drive all your enemies out in one year. Why? Because you will take possession, with, for, you will take possession of a land that you cannot actually manage. So what I will do is I will drive the enemies out little by little so that as I'm driving the enemies out, you are growing into your ability to manage the land that I gave you. And it's important for us to realize several things here. First of all, there is an enemy in any land that there's a promise. There is strategically placed in your land, in your promised land, enemies that are not made to beat you, but are made to treat you in a way that build up your character and your, your faith in God so that you can actually rule in the promised land. And um, I think uh, in, the, in Jesus, it says that Jesus was, he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit, capital S, to be tempted by the devil. How many of you understand that there's two people who want to kill you? Jesus wants to kill you, and the devil wants to kill you. <clears throat> they both have similar agendas. One wants to kill you to raise you from the dead, and the other wants to kill you to take you to hell. But, the, but the Jesus, we, it's important for us to understand that Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit, not by the devil. And the Holy, Spirit's, the Holy Spirit knew that in order for Jesus to have public ministry, he had to first have a private victory. And it's, it's, impor it's, it's important for us to remember that before you can ever have a public ministry, from God's perspective, you need to have a private victory. Everybody needs to have a wilderness experience. Everybody needs to have a, a season when God weakens you to the point where the enemy sees, see, he's an opportunist. It says in the book of Luke that the devil waited for an opportune time. You understand that the devil is insane, but he's not stupid. He waits for an opportune time. For, he waits till you're weak. And, the, and the, the, the strategy of the Holy Spirit was to have Jesus fast for 40 days until he got weak. And when he got weak, he drew, when he got weak, when the Holy Spirit allowed Jesus to get really weak, then he knew that when Jesus was weak, that the whole, that, that would draw the devil into the wilderness with him. How many of you understand that in your weakness, God is strong? <laughs> when we are weak, he is strong. And his strength is actually perfected in our weakness. The goal of the wilderness is not to destroy you, it's to destroy your enemy. God wants to, wants to invite your enemy into your wilderness so that you can beat him in the wilderness. And once you beat him in the wilderness, your private victory gives you a public platform. The Bible says that Jesus learned obedience through the things he suffered. I don't know if you just heard that. Jesus, how many of you know that Jesus never sinned? Jesus never sinned, but it says he learned obedience obedience through the things he suffered now is is disobedience sin yes so jesus never disobeyed but he learned obedience see obedience isn't it, it, obedience isn't just isn't the fact that i disobey obedience me uh, obedience is is you know disobedience means i'm doing i'm doing what i was told not to do but obedience is i'm doing what i was told to do and Jesus learned obedience through the things he suffered. God molded Jesus. Why did Jesus not come into public ministry till he was 30 years old? Wouldn't it have been awesome if he came into ministry at 20 years old and had 13 years of ministry instead of three years of ministry? Think about what he did in three years. John said if the, all the miracles that Jesus did were written down, the world itself could not contain the books. So think about if Jesus would have actually had a public ministry that was 13 years long or, or, or 30 years long instead of three years long. I, I think that those 30 years were preparation. God was molding Jesus. Jesus was learning things he needed to learn so that he could be launched into ministry. <laughs> That's a good word right there. <laughs> and so many times we get a prophetic declaration in our life and we're like, woohoo! I'm going to be, I'm going to, I'm awesome. I'm convinced of this. The more time you get the same, the more times you get the same 
word. There's a reason why you keep getting the same word over and over and over. Typically because God gives you a word and the circumstances go the opposite direction. And God says, I want to lead you all the way down to the top. Joseph Garlington said this when he was here. He said, God closes one door and opens another, but it's hell in the hallway. I noticed that in our movement, that, that I'm a part of, very much a part of, that we talk about God closing one door and opening another, but we don't very often talk about the process. And I think that one of the things that we would try to revisit this year pretty uh, uh, much more frequently in our school of ministry is teaching the students that there is a process to greatness. There is a process to greatness because they get in our school and they learn how to do the signs and wonders and miracles and everything is instant and someone, if someone you know, they encounter a problem, they're like, my job is to bring a miracle to a problem. My, problem, my job is to bring the impossible to the, to the uh, um, my job is to bring the possible to the impossible. My job is to do wonders and signs, to raise the dead, to heal the sick, to cast out demons, and everything's about, being, uh, everything's about instant, and, which I think is amazing. They encounter someone that's, had, that's been sick for years, and they pray for them, and all these testimonies we hear every week is about God did something instant. But in the midst of that, I find that God's kingdom is not always instant. That there's oftentimes a process, and that person that you prayed for that got instantly healed was six years sick, ten years sick. That person that you prayed for that got instantly, their marriage got instantly restored was 15 years in the process. And that, there's, that, there, that process is a part of God's kingdom. And thank God for the, the miraculous, for the miraculous interventions of Christ. You know, Jesus healed the guy at the pool of Bethesda instantly. You know, he was lame. But the Bible says he was there for 37 years. So what we saw was instant. God waits a long time to act suddenly. And sometimes it's in those suddenlies, you know, the, it's in those, that process. And again, I, I'm not talking about sickness. I don't, I don't think people should be sick one day. But I am saying the process, the process that, that we go through, that trials take us through, those, that process is good for us. If you're anything like me, you know, we have four children and eight grandchildren. I would, I like to keep my, my children and grandchildren from any pressure. I don't like anything to go wrong in their life. I want, if I had my choice, they would be rich and famous and beautiful and awesome from the day they were born. I would put them in this little bubble and I would keep them completely safe. And then sometimes things happen in their lives that, that as you as a parent or grandparent, like you can't keep them from it. It's like you want to this hug them, keep them, come to my house, we'll lock the doors, everything will be fine. And God's all, would you leave them alone? I'm molding a great man. I am molding a great woman. Would you stop trying to protect the people that I am molding? And we forget that it's the same way God molded us, but we want to protect them from the, from the potter's hands. And, you know, this morning I'm reminded of the, of the story of Joseph, which is, Actually, one of my very favorite stories in the Bible, he's one of my favorite characters in the, in the Old Testament. And in, in Genesis chapter 37, he, uh, it says in verse 3 that, that because Joseph was the son, uh, was the, um, I'll better read it. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a very colored tunic. And his brother, when his brothers saw that his father loved him, more than the other brothers, they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. So they hate Joseph. He's the youngest son. Well, they end up having Benjamin later. But he's the, he's the youngest son of 11, of 11 brothers. And they hate him because the father favors him. And it says that Joseph had a dream. And you know the story. In the fifth, in the fifth verse, it says, Then Joseph had a dream, and he told his brothers. And they hated him even more. And the dream was that he was going to be great, that Joseph was going to be great, and that his brothers were going to serve him. And when, they, when, Joseph, comes, when Joseph has this dream, he comes out and he tells his brothers, ah, it's this dream last night. Yeah. And you know, your sheaves and my sheaves were together, and your sheaves bowed down to my sheaves. <laughs> and it says when his brothers heard the dream, they hated him even more. And then the next day he has another dream. And in the other dream, he sees 11 sheaves, and he sees the sun and the moon. And he says, I saw 11 sheaves bowing down to me, and the sun and the moon. And it said this, that his father rebuked him, but he pondered those things in his heart. 
in his heart. The father pondered the, that word in his heart, but the brothers hated him even more. You know, how many of you understand that, that Joseph, that that became Joseph's prison process to the palace? But I have a sense that there was another way to get there. Sometimes we read the story and we're like, well, you know, that's God's sovereign will. Like, you know, he just, he opened his mouth and he, they threw him in prison and, you know, that was, that's what God wanted. God wanted him in prison so he could take him to the palace. And I like to propose to you that God has many ways to the palace. There's one way into the kingdom, but there's many ways to the palace. <laughs> and sometimes we choose our own way. And I think Joseph learned wisdom through the things he suffered. I don't know if you got that. Like Joseph was pretty wise by the time he got to talk to Pharaoh, but he wasn't too smart when he talked to his brothers. You know, when you're the youngest brother and every one of your brothers can whip your butt, it's kind of stupid to stand up and go, hey, you know, I had a dream about you guys. <laughs> Let me tell you about it. They wanted to kill him. So they throw him in a pit, and you, 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 know, you know that story. They throw him in a pit, and his old, in fact, they're going to kill him and throw him in a pit, but their oldest brother, Reuben, talks him out of killing him. And, and then the Midianites come by, and they're like, they're, they're slave traders, and they're like, hey, hey, we can make a profit on our brother. So they help him out of the pit, and I'm sure when they help him out of the pit, Joseph's thinking, my brother's repented. <laughs> I don't know about you, but there are people that, that your, your favor, the favor on your life causes them either to hate you or want to take advantage of you. Somebody once said that if you become successful, you'll have false friends and true enemies. But be successful anyway. See, when you become successful, you have, you have people that hate you and you don't even know why. It's, it's kind of the story of, of Cain and Abel. It says that, that God accepted Cain, I'm sorry, accepted Abel and accepted his sacrifice but rejected Cain's sacrifice. When Cain saw the favor that was on Abel, he hated Abel. What did Abel do? Abel didn't do anything. The problem was is that when favor is on one person and not on another, instead of people finding out what it takes to get favor from God, they typically hate people who have favor. Or they try to figure out some way, you know, people are opportunists and they try to figure out some way to use your favor to make money for themselves. And that's what Joseph's brothers did. They used his favor. They used the favor that's on Joseph. They sold him into, into prison. And I think that the, the university of brotherhood is often how God promotes us to the palace. That it's oftentimes, oftentimes you have to have conflict with your brother before you ever have a conflict with the with, with the giant. The same thing happened in the days of David. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, David comes to the battle line and he's supposed to bring his brother some lunch. And when he gets there, Goliath stands up just in time, you know. It's the 40th day. And, and Goliath stands up and he begins to taunt the armies of the living God. And David gets there and David's like, hey, hey, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who thinks he can taunt the armies of the living God? And somebody says, to, he hears somebody saying, well, if somebody kills him, the king's going to give him his daughter and he's going to make him tax free. He goes, say what? Hey, say what? You mean the woman? You mean, you mean Michael? He says, yeah. He says, you mean, now tell me that again. You mean if someone kills this guy? Yeah, the guy says, yeah. If someone kills this guy, he's getting the king's daughter and he's going to become tax free the rest of his life. He turns to another guy, he says, tell me that story again. And while he's telling the story the third time, Eliv, his oldest brother, comes to him and says, David, what are you doing? Go home. Take care of your small, stupid sheep. Before you can ever fight a giant, you find yourself fighting your brothers. <laughs> Some of you are like, hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Joseph found that the path to the palace in order to get to the palace that he, he had to get past his brothers. And David, it's interesting that when Samuel the prophet came to Jesse's house, David's house, Jesse's house, 
to anoint a king. God had said, go to Jesse's house and anoint a king. And when Samuel got there, he saw Elib, who was taller than anyone else, any of the other boys, and the oldest son of Jesse. And he went to anoint him, and God said, do not look. Samuel, do not look as man looks. Look as God looks. And so he looked at all of Samuel's seven boys, and he said to Samuel, I am sure that God sent me here, but I don't see a king here. Do you have any more children? And he said, oh yes, well, I have a youngest son. He's out in the wilderness. He's out with the sheep. And the prophet said, go get him. And David said this in the Psalms, in sin I was conceived. Probably David was conceived through an adulterous relationship. It's probably why the prophet didn't bring him to the table. He says, in sin I was conceived. So David comes in to the house while the prophet waits. And when he walks through the house, it says he was short and ruddy. He's just kind of like, didn't look like a king at all. And God says, that's the guy I've anointed king right there. Anoint him king. And you know what happened. He anoints him king in 1 Samuel 15. But David doesn't become king for 14 years. Because Saul, King Saul, is jealous of him and resists him. When he comes home from killing Goliath, the women line the streets and they're singing, David, Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his ten thousand. And it says this, and Saul was jealous that day and Saul was suspicious that day. And the next verse says, and an evil spirit from the Lord, from the Lord tormented Saul. How many of you understand that jealousy builds a highway to hell? Let me say that again. Jealousy in our lives builds a highway to hell. It opens the door for all kinds of evil in our life. Jealousy is one of the most socially accepted sins in the body of Christ, and yet it's one of the most destructive things in your life. If you allow jealousy in your life, it says this in the, uh, in the book of uh, James. Let me find it here. It says, it's really powerful too. As soon as, as, soon as I find it, you'll be so glad I did because I put it in here somewhere. Oh, it's probably not the book of James. That's the problem. Here it is. It's awesome, too. You should really read your Bible. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't find it. But it says, where there's jealousy or selfish ambition, there is every evil thing. What happened to that verse? Well, yeah, don't talk to me. Here it is. James 3.14. But if you have bitter jealousy or selfish ambition in your heart, don't be arrogant and lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes from above. It is earthly, get this, earthly, natural, demonic. Earthly, See the, the process? Earthly, natural, demonic. And it says, where there is jealousy or selfish ambition, there is disorder in every evil thing. What happens? It, it starts out as earthly, natural, demonic. What happens when you open our heart to jealousy is we end up with creating a highway for, for evil spirits to actually invade our life. It says that Saul was jealous of David. He was suspicious of David. And then an evil spirit from the Lord came upon Saul. Do you understand that discernment anointed by jealousy is suspicion? Your gift of discernment anointed by jealousy becomes suspicion. And you build a case against people, and the real issue is you're jealous of them. And uh, Claudia Keith said this several years ago. He said if you're jealous of someone... He said, invest in them, and then their victory will become your victory. What do I do if I'm jealous of someone? You know, I just sit in the corner and say, I, I rebuke the spirit of jealousy. Well, that probably will be helpful, but what will be more helpful is that you take the person that you're jealous of, and you begin to invest in them, so that their victory becomes your victory, that you, that you, were, that you were born to make other people famous. What, what should have Saul done? What was Saul's responsibility? Do you understand that if Saul would have been a real father, when they said Saul killed his thousands and David killed his ten thousands, 
How many of you understand that if Saul would have had a father's heart, he would have celebrated that song? Jesus said it this way, greater work shall you do when I go to be with the Father. One of the goals of this culture is that people can outgrow us, that we can stand on the sidelines, we can sing with the women, so to speak, and say, that's an awesome song. You're already moving in greater dimensions than I am, and you're a young man. But instead, Saul got jealous. And so it goes on to talk about um, Saul's jealousy, but I want to go back to Joseph. It says that Joseph, verse uh, 39 I'm sorry, chapter 39, and it says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ishmaelites. And, they'd take, and when they'd taken him down there, and the Lord was with Joseph. Get this. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Here's Joseph. He's in prison. No, he's, in, he's a slave in Egypt. He's a slave in Egypt. And what is God's commentary on him? He's a successful man. See, success isn't measured by what you accomplish, but by who you serve. So we have to change the way we measure success. We look around, somebody has a beautiful house, and nice cars, and you know, they make a lot of money. Well, that person's successful. Well, Joseph, God said Joseph was successful, and he was a slave. He didn't own anything. And God said he was a successful man. Why? Because he was faithful to God in hard circumstances. Do you know that trials do not test your character? Consider it all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith. Trials test your faith. When Joseph is a slave, what does he have to do? He has to believe that the vision that he saw, the dream that he saw, I'm going to be great. Greatness is in me. He has to believe that when he is in slavery, that God's word is still true in his life. The psalmist wrote this, that the word of the Lord tested Joseph until Joseph's word came to pass. In other words, Joseph had this word. I mean, I'm not saying he had it for himself, but he got it by himself. He had this word for himself that greatness was in him, that he was going to rule his brothers and his father. But it says that the word, that word tested Joseph until his word came to pass. There's something about the process of the potter's hands that the prophetic word actually tests you. When you get a prophetic declaration, especially when you get two or three or four, the same word spoken over you over and over, you can, you can, just, about, you can just about guarantee yourself that between, between the palace and the, and the, and the uh, I'm sorry, between the promise and the palace is probably many miles. I will say the greater the destination, the longer the gestation. You get lots and lots of words, the same word over and over, I would, I would, I would tell you, you're going to need them. You're going to need to remember those words because God has a long way around to the palace. And some of us make it longer. You know, I, I honestly think that you can, you can lengthen you can lengthen your trial. You can lengthen your process, but I don't think you can shorten it. The Bible says that there is no temptation except for this common to man. And that God would give you a way of escape. I love it right there. I wish there was a period right there. But the rest of the verse says, so that you may endure it. Listen, my idea of escape isn't like, and, and there is no temptation except for it's common to man. I like that, that part of the verse. It means, hey, misery loves company, and when you're going through a trial, you, welcome to the family of God. You know, I've gotten to know some of, the, some of the most famous people in the body of Christ. I've had the privilege of getting to know many of them. I've gotten to know people that have it all together in business and have lots of money, and I get behind the scenes, and I've figured this out. It doesn't matter how much money you have, how well you dress, how much your kids smile, underneath the surface, everybody has struggles. Everybody has struggles. Everybody that 20 years ago I admired from a distance and I'm like, one of these days I'm just going to get to shake their hand. Many of those people I've had in my office more than shake their hand and they have struggles like everybody else. And I realized like you, there's nobody immune from struggles. I'm not talking about sin. There's nobody immune from struggle. I don't care. You name them. You know, you think of who, you know, there's people, obviously, I don't know. But we take the famous people of the world that we put up on a pedestal. We're like, 
oh, that person's got money, he's got fame, he's got a beautiful kid, beautiful wife, got a beautiful husband, got a wonderful life, he's driving a nice car. Oh, life is good for them. And you get to know them and they have the same struggles you have. And ex buying things externally does not fix things internally. It's just, it's like there is no temptation except for is common to all men and women. And God provides a way of escape so you can pass through it. Pass through it and escape. They just, just two things don't seem to go together to me. <laughs> to me, escape means I get around it. God goes, you're going through it. When we're talking about temptation, it's important to understand this. Temptation is not sin. It says that Jesus was tempted in every way except without sin. If I was hungry and hadn't eaten all day and I went to your house and you said, hey, I'll be back in an hour and you left a platter of sushi on the table, I wouldn't be tempted. <laughs> I hate sushi. It wouldn't tempt me at all. I wouldn't even be like, oh, sushi, man. I wonder how long it's going to be before he gets back. Maybe I should call and ask if I can just have one. It wouldn't, it wouldn't tempt me at all. Now, if you put a platter of hot lobster tails with butter Oh, man, what time is it? Oh, I'm hungry, man. I'm so hungry. If you put a platter of lobster tails, hot lobster tails with butter, and you said, I'll be back in an hour, dude, I'd probably fall. See, in order for me to be tempted, I have to have a desire for the thing it is that you put in front of me. I cannot be tempted with something I have no natural draw to. It says that Jesus was tempted in every way, in every way, except without sin. Temptation is not sin. This is, this is important for all of us to remember because it says that the devil accuses, he's the accuser of the brother and he accuses us day and night. Some of you are like, man, I'm failed, I'm nobody, I'm nothing, I'll never amount to anything. It's like, uh, just every day I'm just tempted it's like, yeah, that's called the trial that is molding you. Your job is to manage your appetite. Not get rid of it. Manage it. Don't eat the lobster. Don't even think about it. Some of us just kind of rove around the lobster tail, just smelling the lobsters, you know. It's like, it's like what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? I, I, I didn't eat one. You did in your mind. <laughs> I think you know what I'm saying, right? Goes on Joseph's story. So, Joseph's, uh, so Joseph, um, Potiphar's wife is totally immoral and wants to uh, have sex with Joseph. And Joseph is like, he stays away from her. It says that day and night he was tormented by her. Then one day there's nobody home, all the servants are gone, and she comes in and she tries to get him in the bedroom, and he's like, he runs out, he totally refuses, and she rips her clothes and starts yelling, Joseph, rape me, Joseph, rape me. And when her husband comes home, Potiphar takes Joseph and he throws him into prison. This is what it says about Joseph's prison experience. So Joseph's master took him and put him in jail. In the place where the prisoners were confined, he was there in the jail. But the Lord was with, I love this, but the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. And the chief jailer committed to Joseph the charge of all the prisoners who were in jail so that whatever, he, uh, there was, whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made prosper. Here's the guy now, he's in prison. And God goes, he's a successful man. You know what happens when you put a prince in a prison? He makes the prison a palace. It doesn't matter what circumstances you're in. It matters what your stances are. Listen, are you living from virtues and values and relationship? Or are, you or are you living from circumstances? Listen, if you let your circumstances control your attitude, you're going to have... You you just, your, your attitude is just going to be blowing in the wind. You determine... Listen, your, your, inner, your inner world is supposed to determine your outer world, not vice versa. You're supposed to live from the inside out. 
There's so many people, it's like, I, I had a friend once. <laughs> Before I came to Bethel. And my friend had, uh, ha- is a very wealthy man and has a, a very large business and he was having some struggle with his kids and some struggle with his wife and his business wasn't making money. And he, went, he flew halfway across the country to see the most famous psychiatrist in the in, um, in United States. This is a true story. And he gets there and he sits down. I think at the time it was like 300 bucks an hour. So he sits down with the psychiatrist and, and the, uh, the guy says, you know, the psychiatrist says, you know, what's going on in your life? And he starts to tell him, you know, my, my son's not doing good, and my wife doesn't like me, my business is losing money, and, 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 so, and, and, and so I'm depressed. And so the, the uh, psychiatrist said, so, yeah, so, so, so why are you depressed? He said, no, you didn't understand. I said, my business is losing money, my son's having a struggle, my wife's mad at me. He goes, no, the psychiatrist said, no, I heard you say that. I, I'm asking you why you were depressed. He said, no, you didn't hear me. I said... My business is losing money. My son is not doing good. My wife is upset with me. And the the psychiatrist says, happiness is an inside job. He was only in the office about four minutes. My friend stood up, put $300, $100 bills on, or whatever it was, whatever the amount was, on his desk and turned around and started walking out. The psychiatrist ran and caught him in the parking lot. He said, you only been here five minutes. He said, I, we haven't done any therapy yet. He said, oh no, I totally got what I came for. He said, I thought my circumstances were dictating my attitude. I didn't realize it was me who made those choices. Nobody makes you mad. Oh, that person makes me mad. Nobody makes you mad. You choose to be mad. Mad's in there, circumstances draws it out. You can't draw out what isn't in there. Trials. Trials don't make you mad. Trials just reveal what's in there. That's a good word. <laughs> Remember that, Chris, next time you're mad. You make me so mad. Remember your word? You know, if you give, some, if you give birth to something prematurely, you need artificial life support to keep it alive. Proverbs 27 says, The crucible is for silver, the furnace is for gold, and each one is tested by the praise accorded him. How many of you understand that favor is a trial? That is such a good word. If Bill was here, he would be, oh, he'd be going, that rock. Proverbs 17.3 uh, says, The refining pot is for silver, the furnace is for gold, but the Lord tests the hearts. Paul wrote this in the book of Acts. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom. Do you know that the, in the New Jerusalem, the book of Revelation, every door, every gate into the New Jerusalem is a single pearl? Why? Through many tribulations, you enter the kingdom. You know what a pearl is made out of? Irritation. It's a clam. It's not a clam. It's an oyster. Well, that's a clam, isn't it? Listen, don't clam up on me, all right? It's an oyster that, that got irritated and, 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 and produced a pearl. I mean, what if you're in the oyster of God? <laughs> oh, anyway. You get the idea. It's like these trials that we go through are designed by God to make you a beautiful pearl so that you can be entrance into the kingdom. So that your life can be an entrance. You just don't have a message. Once you get into the clam, you become the message. (laughs) Yeah. It's a good word. Many years ago, we were living in Weaverville, and I was working at a tire store where I met Danny Silk. I'm going to write a book about that when we're both dead. Um, <laughs> actually, I'll write it before I die. We'll just release it after we're both dead. But it's where we met, Danny and I. Danny wasn't yet a believer in his heart, but he was a good non-believer. But anyway, so <laughs> we better go on. 
So I'm working at the tire store, and you know, we met Bill a, a couple of years before that, and we just really, Kathy and I just really fell in love with Bill. And what I saw on Bill, when I, when I met Bill, I'm like, this is the kind of man I want to be. You know, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate me. Be imitators of me. And I saw that in Bill. When I met Bill, I'm like, I never have met a man that I wanted to be like. And when I met Bill, I'm like, I want to be like Bill. <laughs> you know, it's like, I want to be like Michael. I want to be like Bill. And, and I, just, I just really, really, really loved Bill. I still do, actually. It's a miracle. <clears throat> now, Bill's the one person in life that doesn't have problems. <laughs> and so I began to have this intense passion. I want to be in the ministry. I want to be like Bill. I want to be in the ministry. I began to dream about it and think about it all the time. And then one day, Charlie Harper um, was, t- was taking me to... Uh, the tire shop, and we passed by the 76 station in Weaverville, the only 76 station in Weaverville. And as we passed by it, Charlie said to me, hey, I had a dream last night. I go, yeah? He said, yeah, in the dream you owned the 76 station. Huh. I said, I don't want to be in the service station business. I want to be in the ministry. He said, I'm just telling you what I've dreamt. I'm like, well, keep it to yourself. The very next day, we had a a young man over our house. He was an African-American man. His name was Danny. And Danny was a prophet. In those days, he prophesied often a little bit different. Danny was kind of an old, kind Pentecostal guy. So we have him over the house. And when he prophesied, he kind of looked like he's in a trance. So we're we're eating dinner. We're all laughing and joking. The kids are around the table. And all of a sudden, Danny gets that look on his face like, you know, that Ezekiel look. I can't even do it anymore. I used to be able to do it really well. But, and, and, he, and he stops, and he stops eating, and he gets the Ezekiel look on his face. And he goes, hey, brother, the Lord says that if you open up a business, he will bless you. And I still remember, it's just like it was yesterday. I said, well, you tell the Lord, I don't want to be in business. <laughs> and this is what he said. He goes, Brother, I'm just telling you what he said. I said, well, you just tell him what I said. (laughs) The next, that Sunday, Dick Mills was was with us. You know Dick Mills? uh, He and uh, Dick Joyce were the only two prophets we knew in those days. Dick Mills used to come to our church a couple times a year. So Dick Mills is there. And after um, he ministered on Sunday morning, we all went to lunch with him, all the elders. So we're sitting around the table, and I'm sitting right next to Dick Mills. And he's giving out prophetic words to people. And, you know, he's, he's a real big kind of jolly guy. And he turns to me and he goes, God is giving you wisdom. I'm like, I received that. For business. <laughs> he's giving you double wisdom. The wisdom of God and the wisdom of man are going to flow together in you. And you are going to have, you're going to have wisdom from two kingdoms. And God's giving you wisdom for business. And I'm thinking, I don't want wisdom for business. So that was Sunday. So Monday morning, I go see Bill. And I'm like, look, dude, I, I want to be in the ministry. And Bill's like, you're in the ministry. I'm like, no, no, I want to be in the ministry where they pay you to talk. <laughs> it's the ministry I want to be. I want to be paid to talk like you. <laughs> and I've got three words in one week. Like, you're going to be in the ministry. You're going to own the service station. You've got double wisdom for business. I don't want wisdom for any of that stuff. I want to be in the ministry. And Bill's all, it's, you know, it's good. I wouldn't worry about it, you know. If God wants it to happen, he'll make it happen. You know, just all the things you would say to someone. Like, you know, just, I just kind of like put it on a back shelf and someday if it happens, whatever. I'm like, all right. I still remember getting up and saying, well, I still want to be in the ministry. So I walk out of the door. That was Monday morning. I got up early to meet with Bill Monday morning. And, and Monday, right after lunch, I get a phone call. We're working at the tire store, and I get a phone call. And it's this guy, I answer the phone. He goes, hi, I'm Robert McLaughlin. Oh, hi. He goes, you don't know me, but I own the 76 station in town. <laughs> and he goes, I want to sell the station, but I don't want anybody to know it. And I feel like I'm supposed to sell it to you. <laughs> He's not a Christian. He goes, I feel like I'm supposed to sell it to you. Are you interested? I'm thinking, no, I want to be in the ministry. But I figure if I say that, I might get, just get hit by lightning and die right there. <laughs> Swallowed by a fish or attacked by a grease something. So, 
So I said, yeah, I'm kind of I'm I'm interested. So I have breakfast with him. And the long story short is it was going to take $42,000, $9,000 down. And I'm like, I am so excited. This is the first time in my life I've ever been excited to be broke. <laughs> we were a month behind on our, on our house payment, and I have no money. So I come home, and I, Kathy says, what did Robert say? He said, oh, he wants to sell us the station, but it's $42,000, $9,000 down. And she goes, oh. I said, yeah, I'm so glad we're broke. I want to be in the ministry. She's like, well, you ought to call your grandmother and see if she'll give you a down payment. I'm like, I'm going to call my grandmother. She let my cousin go under for half of that. I'm not, do- no, I'm not doing that. So she um, encouraged me. <laughs> encouraged me in the Lord for two days until the plague finally ended and I... I called my grandmother, and my grandmother's not a believer, so I called my grandmother and I said, da da da, you know, this is what I want to do. I didn't say anything about the Lord, and you know, I need nine thousand dollars down. And she said, okay, well, let me think about it. So, okay, so I think she called me the next day or a couple days later. She calls, hi, you know, this is Grandma. Hi, Grandma, how you doing? She's like, good. You know, I, I was thinking about what you asked for nine thousand dollars, and she said, I said, yeah. She said, I won't give you the money. And I said, yeah, I didn't think you would. She said, but she says, I won't lend you the money. I said, yeah, I thought you wouldn't. She said, but I'll give it to you. But you can't tell any of the other kids. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> My grandmother gives me the money. We take over the service station. We have a 30 day escrow. We take it over 30 days before we, the escrow actually closes. Robert is, says, you know, why don't you just take it now? And then at the end of 30 days, you can just put the money in the escrow and everything's fine. So I got the nine grand. We run in the business, but we don't have any money to run business. So we use up $1,400 of the 9000 so on the 27th day, Robert comes, hey, put the money in escrow. Well, I don't want to tell him I'm 1,400 short. So I say, okay, no problem. I'm thinking, you know, we'll get some money today. And on the 28th day comes, no money. 29th day comes, no money. On the 30th day, he stops by early in the morning. He's like, hey, you have to put the money in escrow today. I'm like, yeah, 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 uh-huh. As soon as he drives out of the driveway, I go in the back room. I'm like, this is your fault. I want to be in the ministry. You put me in this situation. What's up with this? Talk to me. Hello, hello. <laughs> About 12 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm underneath a car on a creeper, and um, Daryl Miller comes, and he, he gets some gas, and comes in the shop, and he hands me some money. So I put it in my pocket. I'm still laying on the creeper. Thank you very much. Good to see you. He goes, hey, why don't you look at it? So I pull the money out of my, out of my shirt pocket, and it's 14 $100 bills the last day that we needed it. And a man came into his store, said, I don't want, to, I don't want you to tell Chris who I am, but um, last night I had a dream, and in the dream I was giving him 14 $100 bills, so here's 14 $100 bills, and we got the station. Yeah, well, you won't be clapping when I tell you the rest of the story. So I'm like, this is amazing. I am going to be a multi-millionaire. I'm going to be a multi-millionaire because God said, if you open a business, I'm going to bless you. And I'm thinking, I'm going to be the first guy who ever became a millionaire in a service station in the world. They're going to write, I'm going to be in a fun of time magazine. Yeah, this is how I did it. <laughs> first thing God tells me when escrow closes, the day escrow closes, God goes, I don't want you to be open Sundays anymore. I'm like, say what? Every service station in the world is open on Sundays. He goes, well, you won't be. I'm like, all right. Well, it doesn't matter because... I can make as much money in six days blessed than you can make in seven days unblessed, so I'll close one day, no problem. Well, that didn't work at all. First, first week, Forest Service brings their truck in to, have us, to try us out. Forest Service, biggest account in town. They want six tires and six wheels mounted. That's all we have to do. And then mount them on wheels and put them on the truck. My, man, my, my, my guy leaves the truck out at night, leaves the, the tires and wheels in the back. Next morning, Kim, they're stolen. That's day two. They're stolen. I have to buy new tires, new wheels. That's about two grand. Yeah, kind of awesome. And then, so we buy, the, the, we buy those. But it's okay, because we're going to be a millionaire. What's well, $2,000? The next week, the probation department, the head of the probation department, his name's Dick Maybe. He spent, he spent about five years restoring this 64 and a half Mustang. Just brought it from the body shop to my place so I can rebuild the carburetor. 
new motor, new interior, new everything. Started from the frame up. Spent five years rebuilding it in his garage. Had the body shop paint it and drop it off. Needs the carburetor rebuilt. I take the carburetor off. I put a tape, a note to the steering wheel with felt pen. Do not start this car. I take the keys and I ditch him. That night, I get a phone call from my guy who closes. You need to come down here right now. I said, what's wrong? The Mustang's on fire. There was a lock on the hood. When he, he, he got in the car and cranked and cranked and cranked it, he found the keys, spent a half an hour finding the keys. Cranked and cranked and cranked it till it blew up. Couldn't get the hood open. By the time the fire department got there, the wheels were melted, the interior was melted, and the only thing was left was the frame and a piece of the car. That was the second week. <laughs> Thank you very much. And the story go on. I, have, I probably have at least 300 stories. My neighbor, a Jewish man who hates my guts because my dog tore into his garbage every day for years. I would tie my dog up. He would break the leash and eat his garbage. There was, there, was, there was people all around, but he would eat his garbage. And he would call me yelling, I'm going to kill your dog. I'll, be, I'll buy you the bullet. It went on for years. This guy's named Barney. He hated my guts. One day, Barney pulls in a lot. He's got a Fiat a sports car that he's been restoring. He took it to the same body shop. Had it, they just got it out of the body shop. Drove it from the body shop to my place. He hates my guts. He's never done business with me in five years. Pulls into the driveway. I'm thinking, oh gosh, now what did my dog eat? He gets out of his car. He's like, hey. And I see him coming. I'm like, hi, how you doing? You know, like pouring it on. Like, oh, Jesus loves you. My dog got saved last week. You know, he <laughs> baptized him and everything, you know. I can't even figure out why he's here. And I got butterflies in my stomach. I, think, I can't even believe what my dog could have eaten this week. And he goes, hey, I just got my car out of the body shop. I've been working on it for a couple of years. I've seen it on blocks in his front yard for years. He goes, I just got it painted. And they said that I should bring, I have electrical problem. They said, you're the only person who can fix it. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, no problem. Let me get a work order. So I get a work order. I'm standing out there. It's a summer day. And I'm doing a work order. Well, that morning, Dr. Duberstein, who owns an international scout, he has his own plane. He drops off his car about once a month and leaves it for a week while we fix it. So he drops off his international scout, parks it at this wall. So here's a wall, station. You park here, you can park here, and there's a horseshoe, right? So we're over here. So I'm talking to M Mr. Barney and talk to him about his car. And he's like, yeah, I need this fix, and this light doesn't work, and this thing doesn't work. And I'm like taking notes. And he goes, hey, is anybody in that international scout I look over and I'm like, oh yeah, it's rolling out of the driveway. And, I'm, and so and he, when he asked me that, I'm going, oh yeah, that's no problem. Because it's been there all day and it's 5 o'clock at night and he parked it there at 6 in the morning. So I, I look around at my men to see who's, I'm counting my men. I have seven men, so I'm like counting them. One, two, three, four, five. By the time the car gets to the, 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 the exit of the driveway, I've counted all my men. I'm like, I wonder who is driving that car. So... so well, I'm talking to him, so I'm now I'm kind of like, I'm trying to act nonchalant about it, like, mm, <laughs> taking notes. Now I got my body turned. The car pulls, it, it rolls out of the driveway by itself. Been there 10 hours. Rolls out of the driveway, turns left, comes backwards up the highway. It's God's truth. Comes backwards up the highway, turns left at the driveway we're at, comes backwards. I throw Barney out of the way. It hits his car, going about five miles an hour. $1,400 damage. And then it takes off down the road. All seven, it's all locked up with seven of my guys chasing it. Barney's laying on the ground. He's a little guy. He looks up at me and he goes, I'm not kidding you. I would have never believed this if I didn't see it with my own eyes. I bought a $27,000, not $100, $27,000 alignment machine. I had it one day, ran over it with the Forest Service truck, <laughs> fell off the rack on top of it. One day. Oh, I could just tell you story after story. 
had an air conditioning can blow up and blew every light out and blew the lady's hood right off the car while she's in the... <laughs> Three weeks after we had the station, we had a car accident and ran two cars into each other. And by the end of the day, we had wrecked three cars. <laughs> if you open the station, I'm going to bless you. I worked there nine years we owned that, that, that prison. Nine years, I'm serious, for nine years, I would lay on the floor and beg God, deliver me from evil. And the spirit of 76 would not leave. I'm serious, I would lay on the floor and weep, God, please deliver me from this service station. This place is hell. I never made any money. I made more money last year than I made in nine years in a service station. If you open a business, I'm going to bless you. Like, now I understand. When you need money, you don't ask for a blessing. You ask for money. I never played blessing. Can you bless me, brother? I go, what do you want? Because I know what God's idea of blessing is. Brother, can you bless me? <laughs> Dude, do you have life insurance? <laughs> Before I pray this prayer, are you fully insured? Because <laughs> God's idea of blessing you is not your idea of blessing you. God is in the people making business. And God uses trials in your life to mold you into the person that you, He's called you to be. And when God says you're going to be blessed, God lives in eternity. It's like when the, you know, the disciples wrote the, the epistles, they're like, Jesus is returning soon. It's been 2,000 years. So when God says, I'm going to bless you, and I go, when? He goes, right away. I don't even know what right away means anymore. <laughs> but I know one thing. When you've been hanging around for a quadrillion years, everything seems fast. <laughs> Jesus, I'll, I'll be right back. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You're like, God, can you hurry and, and pay my pg e bill? He's like, I'll do that right away. <laughs> Five years later, you get the bill paid off, and God's all, wasn't that quick? I mean, you know, when you're 10 billion years old, you know, everything seems fast. But when you only got like 90 years on this planet, it's like, dude, that seems like forever. Like, Abraham, you're going to have a son. Awesome. You know, when he's like 27. He's 90. He's like, hey God, am I going to have a son? Oh yeah, right away. <laughs> Listen, how many of you have figured out God's not in a hurry? And the way that God, when God says, I am going to bless you, God is going to bless you. It's just that His idea of blessing you and your idea of blessing you, they aren't always the same. And I figured out that, you know, the things that, if I have success today, if there's success in my life, which I feel successful. <laughs> it's plastic, does anybody have any wood? I feel like the years that we're experiencing right now were years that we sowed in for 20 years. Listen, this is the truth. We owned businesses for 20 years and never made any money. I would have left after the first year, but I figured if I left too soon, that God wouldn't be finished with me. I seriously prayed, Kathy can tell you this, I prayed every year, God, deliver me from this business. People are like, you're an awesome businessman. I'm like, no, I am not. I suck. <laughs> awesome businessmen make money. I don't know where you're at in your life, but some of you think, man, there's something wrong in my life. And God's all, oh, you're so successful. I'd be like, God, could I be a successful free person instead of a successful prisoner? Because God measures success completely different than we do. 
I kind of, I'll finish with this story. God sent Saul out, King Saul, into battle. Samuel sent Saul into battle. I'll shorten the story. He wins two battles against the Philistines. Wipes them out. Keeps the king alive and some sheep. And God sends Samuel. God says to Samuel, I am sorry that I made Saul king. What a statement. God says, I am sorry I made Saul king. He's disobedient. Saul comes to Samuel comes to Saul and says, Why did you not obey the Lord? He said, I did obey the Lord. Look, wiped out the Philistines, have all the spoil. And he goes, No, no. He said, Don't leave anyone alive. What are those sheep I hear? And what's the king doing here? Oh, we kept those to offer up to God. You know what that is? A religious spirit. And Samuel says, God has torn the kingdom from you and given it to someone else. You know what's amazing about the story? He wins both battles. He wins both battles, and nobody knew he was a loser but God. Sometimes when you're winning, you're really losing. And sometimes when it looks like you're losing, you're really winning. God does not measure success the way you measure success. Just listen, joking aside, God does not measure success the way you measure success. You're going to go someday to heaven, and you're going to have more wealth, more favor, more power than you've ever dreamed of in your wildest, wildest, wildest dreams. And you're going to live there for eternity. You have a long time. I have a long time to be rich and famous. But right now, what we do on this planet has everything to do with what we'll do in eternity. And the most important thing to remember is that whatever God told you to do, if he told you to flip burgers at McDonald's and you got a PhD in psychology and God said, I don't care what your education says, I want you to go to McDonald's and flip burgers. I'd rather flip burgers for eight bucks an hour than be a psychologist someplace if that's what, not what God told me to do. I'm serious. Whatever God told you to do, that's the best thing. It's the best thing. I'm not, God's not against wealth. He's just against you, it owning you. I met with several businessmen, very wealthy businessmen who weren't Christians in a particular country a while back, about 12 of them. And they sat me down. Here's their first question. Not, they're, not, they're not Christians. Their first question, how do we keep money from controlling our hearts? How do we keep money from controlling our hearts? See, God doesn't care that you own money. It just, he just cares that it doesn't own you. That fame doesn't own you. That significance doesn't own you. That God owns you. That God owns me. And anyone who thinks, well, I can't be tempted by that, then you're not, a, you're not being real. You're, not being, you're, you're, not, you're living in denial. Everybody can be tempted by something. Because the Bible says there's no temptation except for common to all men. And our job is to make sure that we don't make agreement with it so that God can take us from the pit and the prison and into the palace. And when we get to the palace, we won't be like King Saul. When we get to the palace, we can stay in the palace because we beat our giants little by little. Amen. Would you stand?